So we got another Grudge film. Uh, I'm not a fan of the Grudge series. As some of you know, I covered some of the Grudge movies. I covered the three American versions. I was going to cover some of the uh, Japanese versions, but honestly, I'm just not a fan of the franchise. In fact, I thought the third American Grudge movie was the best one that I'd seen, and I'd seen maybe five or six of them or something, and that's probably the least liked of them all. So I'm clearly not the target demographic, and when I say it's my favorite, that was the only one that I thought was even okay. Like, I just didn't like any of these films. So when I heard there was a new one coming out, again, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> like, I just didn't have any interest. So, nor did I have the ability to see this when it was in theaters because I had just moved right when it came out, like, literally that week. And it wasn't playing anywhere near me, and I was not in a rush to see it. And then everyone that I knew started hating on it and saying it. It was funny, too, though, because the one thing that somebody said to me that, said, that gave me some hope that I might like this movie was, and I think it was Lee from Drum Dums, he was like, this is not a grudge movie at all. This is nothing like a grudge movie. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe this is okay. And the only other thing that gave me any kind of interest in this movie was the director, uh, Nicholas Pesci, I think is this how you say his last name. And he directed The Eyes of My Mother as well as Piercing. And I was a pretty big fan of uh, Eyes of My Mother. And Piercing I thought was, was interesting. So I was like, oh wow, okay, he's making a Grudge movie. And it's rated R, which all the other ones, um, outside I think of Grudge 3 was rated R, but, but 1 and 2, the Sarah Michelle Gellar ones, those were PG-13 and suffered because of it. So I was like, R rating, an interesting director, People are telling me that it's not really like a grudge movie. I was like, well, I don't know. And then everyone started hating it, and I wasn't surprised by that. Um, but I went into this, and of course, this is very, very similar of a setup to any grudge movie. This is why I don't understand why people are saying this isn't a grudge movie. I mean, the only thing I guess is different is that the Kiyako type character that's in this movie is more zombified. I guess. I mean, but it's, you enter the house. I mean, that's the setup of all of these. Anybody who enters the house takes the curse, the grudge, and they bring it with them. And then they go to someplace else and they bring the fucking curse there with them. Everyone dies. A pretty simple setup. Now, at the end of the day, when this movie ended, actually it was at the beginning of the day. I started when I woke up. So at the beginning of the day, <laughs> I... Didn't I did like this movie? I don't see. I okay. I do understand the dislike for it. The outright hatred I think is unwarranted, but the dislike I do get because I think the problem with the film is a, and this is probably most important because it's a horror movie and it's a certain kind of horror movie. The scares in it, you know, are all seen from a mile away and they're generic cheap jump scares okay so that's a huge crime when it comes to a horror movie and so for that alone i completely understand when someone's like oh this is terrible as a horror movie this is this that's a line that if you cross there's no coming back from it and that's not kind of movie i'm gonna like if as a horror fan so i understand that but i try to look i try to look at everything and then at the end, I'll kind of compile all of my feelings. And if this side outweighs this side, like the like versus the dislike, then I will say I like a movie versus I don't. The things that I, you know, another thing that this pro, uh, film has as an issue is that the story feels muddled. There's a lot of different time periods going on here and they're all working to connect with one another. And they have like these big climatic moments where it's like, oh, remember this person or remember with this moment or remember this? Like, oh, well, this is how this took place. And we kind of already showed you that. But look, here it is again. And now you're shocked by this. The buildup wasn't strong enough for me to have that big like revelation moment where I was like, oh, shit, that's what that was. Oh, crazy. Because the characters, they just their storylines feel very short-lived and there isn't a lot of exploration of them. 
So, and there's so many of them and they're jumping back and forth so much that I kind of lost sight of what was what. I didn't know where was, what was taking place where and when. And I was like, wait, what was this? Is this like before or after? Or was this during? Or who is this before? Is this story before this one or that? Like it just kind of got confused during the film and was like, shit, I would, I think I would need multiple watches to be able to put them in sequential order so I know what, when these took place and how. Um, so that, as I said, that, that got muddled in, in, uh, in its narrative and I think that kind of hurts the film. So those are like my two big issues with the film. Now aesthetically, I really liked the look of the movie. I thought that it had that, you know, kind of, gro- kind of gross, grimy, dark feeling to it. And that's the kind of aesthetic that you want for a movie like this. Um, I did like the way it looked. Um, another thing that I really liked was the kills when they happened. There is a suicide in this movie that takes place in a stairwell. Let's all say in it. And it's one of the most brutal, like, suicides I've seen. Like, ever. Like, I was sh- really taken aback by it. I was like, holy shit, that was brutal. But I loved it. So, that kill alone, like, that's that's the kind of kill that you would insert into a montage of horror clips if you like had you know a youtube channel like this or if you were making a collage of of um, horror scenes that you wanted to put in there and, and they were all just really cool awesome kills and it was like what the hell's that from holy shit that's awesome and people would be like oh that's grudge 2020 and be like but i heard that movie sucked and it's like well the movie's not great but that kill's fucking great i loved that kill um Plus, okay, another really cool thing about this movie is that it's got a really stellar uh, cast. Now, they're more supporting characters, but man, they really stacked the deck in this movie with Frankie Faison and Lynn Shea and John Cho and Betty Gilpin. Is that how you say her name? From Glow and The Hunt and whatever. Um, and you got Jackie Weaver. And you, I mean, there's so many. Damien uh, Big. Bicarno, um, Bish, Bishar, oh, I forget how to say his last name. He's awesome. I and mean, William Sadler, holy shit, he was great in this. And he plays, there's a part in the movie where he plays almost like a, um, what's that character's name from Hannibal uh, that, that uh, Gary Oldman plays, where he has like no face. Like, there's some really cool prosthetics on that on him in this and it's it's really unsettling it's a it's great great prosthetic work on his face it, it, he looks fucked up um and his performance is solid i thought that the john cho um betty G- gilpin gilpin is that how, that's her last name isn't it i swear it is and you see i should write everyone's name down and all that but what fun would that be um it's it's more fun to stumble over my own shit it is for me, though. Some people hate it. That's fine. Um, but I actually really found their story. Um, now, I get it. It's kind of cheap because it plays with something that I think all of us can feel sympathy for. And maybe it's been overdone and this and that. But I thought their performances were so real. Like, there's a scene where Betty's character is talking to her husband because they have something going wrong with them. Um, and it not the grudge, something else. Uh, I don't want to give away too much of anything. But something's happening between them that's tragic. And she looks over at him and she asks him if, she, if he's mad at her. And I don't know why, man, that scene really hit me in the stomach. Like, it, like I felt like I actually like almost teared up because it was such a sad moment and the performances from both of them were so fantastic that I had wished that the whole film focused and centered around them and then the Lynn Shea, Betty, uh, Frankie Faison. Like those two, if they would have been like kind of back to back and just those two narratives. I just feel like there's too many going on here. There's too many characters. There's too many subplots. It just, it lost focus because of that. So I really liked Lynn Shea in this as well. 
Like, there's some movies that Lin Shea is in that she's terrible in, and her acting is dreadful. So I think that she needs a solid director to kind of hone in on her talents. Because she can play, like, Crazy Girl really poorly, and she can play Crazy Girl really well. This is a this is a example of her playing it really, really well. Like, there's a scene where she's in the kitchen, and she, you know... Two scenes, actually, where she's in the kitchen losing her mind, and both are awesome. I thought she was fantastic. And then there's also moments where she's, like, you know, talking to somebody who isn't there. And it's really creepy. Really great use of Lynn Shea here. A movie, Room for Rent, which was actually shot here, where I live, uh, in this very town, not half a mile, a mile from where I'm sitting right now, um, in Sedona, Arizona. Room for Rent. That is a... That is a perfect example of how horrible her performances can be when she's not um, utilized for for her range. Um, and while they're similar, like she's acting creepy in Room for Rent, but she's acting creepy here, it's just, I don't know, She's maybe she's just giving it more because it's a higher production value. I don't know, but <laughs> it's a stark contrast in my opinion. But she's, I think she's fantastic here in the very little screen time and that's just it like you have a John Cho and you have um, Frankie Faison and you have all these Jackie Weaver and you have all these great actors and then you focus on these detective characters that really bring the film down not because they're bad actors I actually thought the performances for both of them were good and I get that they want to have the detectives on the outside investigating but I feel like they should have been background if they were there at all. You know, I would have much rather focused on the the four characters, the four actors that I mentioned there because they're all giving great performances here. And if we could have taken the story and just honed in on them and focused on them, like they passed, you know, they were the family that lived there before and then there's this family now um, and they're just kind of experiencing things simultaneously and they're going back and forth through time, that would have been fine. But they just, they add too much extra here and it just actually starts to kind of become boring at times with a movie that's constantly throwing jump scares at you. It shouldn't feel that way. Um, so it's almost kind of impressive that it does feel that way. But uh, yeah, the, the the scares are all so, so generic. Like, it's all just ripped right out of the textbook of, of every cheap scare ever. There's one where a kid gets out of bed, and this is a scare you've seen now in, but like, in these uh, studio films of recently. I want to say Annabelle did it. Did it. They did it a little different, but it's basically the same scare, um, the same setup for a scare. And I think the first time this was ever done was in Mario Baba's Shock, if my memory serves me correctly. And that scene is fin fucking tastic. When that was originally created, and I understand the desire to use it because it is an effective, you know, crazy thing, crazy looking scare. Um, but I feel like they're overusing it now and it's just becoming um, kind of trite. But regardless, you know, I did like the movie, but only because of key things. And there was a lot that I understand why people wouldn't like it and, and crimes that were committed here. Somebody liked that line. Uh, well, a couple of people liked that line from a recent review I did. Um, <laughs> but yeah, crimes being committed on, on film here, um, that I understand is unforgivable, but I enjoyed my time with it. I, I never, I never felt completely out of it. I always liked the way the film looked. So aesthetically, the whole film looked, um, appealing to me. So while I was watching it, I was just like, okay, like I'm in, I'm enjoying this. And then the kills when they happened, I thought were really cool. And I thought the performances were all pretty damn good from pretty much everybody, except for the kid, the detective's kid in this is horrible, but kid actors, I mean, they, they range. I mean, sometimes you get, um, you know, an Elijah Wood or something, you know, where they're fantastic child actors. 
Um, and then you get a kid like this or the kid from the Shining uh, miniseries or something that you're just like, oh my God, I know this is terrible, but I want to punch a child right now. Like, stop acting. I actually want to beat up their parents like for letting them do it. <laughs> like, no, your kid, don't, don't, don't. Take them back to acting school. You know, maybe they can act later, but right now, let's not put them on screen. Terrible, terrible, terrible acting from that kid. But... Um, but other, but other than that, I feel like everyone else was, was really good. I just feel like every one of them wasn't given enough to do. Like there isn't a lot of depth to anybody. There isn't a lot of revelations that hit because I don't feel connected. I don't feel invested in any character. So as I said, I understand the dislike, but there was enough going on here that it, I liked it in the end. So I hope that all makes sense. Anyways, adios.